Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, creator and host with me across the table. Uh, a little blue around the edges is <laughs> my friend Matthew. Melancholy day. Melancholy. Maybe you have seasonal affective disorder. I know I get that around this time of year and I have a little blue light that I'm going to sit in front of for 20 minutes later. You and your syndromes. Me and my darn syndromes. <laughs> The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Where good eggs hear all about the bad apples. It's true, that's exactly what this show is. Yep, I thought that was a good one. Yeah. If you've had any interest in the Wild West, you've no doubt heard of many of the storied gunmen and bandits from the era, like Butch Cassidy, Jesse James, and Billy the Kid. You probably also think of the United States, but Canada has its own legends and colorful characters from the era on both sides of the border. For example, legendary gunslinger and lawman Bat Masterson was born in Henryville, Quebec. Sometimes the outlaws were women, like one notorious Canadian-born lady bandit and the subject of this episode, whose most famous alias was Pearl Hart. After a rough life with criminal exploits that started during her troubled childhood, Pearl got herself into bigger trouble in Arizona in 1899 and was finally taken into custody after robbing a stagecoach. You are listening to Dark Poutine episode 198, Wild West Canadians, the Lady Bandit, Pearl Hart. Pearl Hart is a fascinating character to whom I was alerted by one of our listeners, Mark Torrey. As well as telling me about Pearl, Mark also said that he began listening to Dark Poutine when we covered Rock Terrio and the Ant Hill Kids from Burnt River, Ontario in episode 69. Mark wrote, Rock and a few of his followers would frequent our potato farm near Kirkfield, Ontario, and I remember them negotiating with Dad, using their French-English dictionary from time to time, to purchase potatoes for their winter supply. You could imagine the shock and surprise when the horrific news broke of the happenings on their compound, end quote. Intrigued by Mark's description of the Lady Bandit, as I dug into Pearl Hart's story, I quickly realized that this is a tough one to sort out fact from fiction, most likely due to the time that's elapsed since the events described in this episode a lack of record-keeping, and the tendency for hyperbole around many of the Wild West legendary characters. I can't guarantee that everything presented is going to be accurate. For example, some accounts claim that Ernest Diamond Dick St. Leon, a famed Texas ranger and gunman who died after a shootout with three horse thieves, was born in Canada, while others claim he was actually born in San Antonio and that it was his parents who were born in Canada. Who knows? You know, I can't not break in here. Yeah, because... That's an interesting name. Diamond Dick. Inquiring minds want to know. Why was he called Diamond yeah. Dick? Do you have any theories on why Diamond Dick? Well, I got excited and I actually looked it up. Oh, you did? Yeah, he wore diamonds or at least diamantes on his uniform. Oh, okay. Well, that's no fun. I was hoping for a more fun theory. <laughs> I know. Than... I, 
I'm wondering if he's a drill sergeant. Why? Well, drill sergeant Diamond Dick it just kind of sounds interesting. Drill bit? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, dear. That's exactly where I expected you to go with it. Well, I'm glad I didn't disappoint. <laughs> you never do. We'll do our best to keep things factual for this episode. We do have Pearl Hart's own account of her life as published in an early volume of Cosmopolitan magazine. However, some of that seems to have been Pearl telling tall tales, unwilling to admit her colorful criminal past. Also useful in the writing of this story, that helped to fill in some of the blanks was John Bessenecker's thoroughly researched and myth-busting book about Pearl, titled Wildcat. The woman who became known as Pearl Hart started her life with another name. She was born Lily Naomi Davy on April 19, 1871 in Lindsay, Ontario. She was the third of the children born to Anna and Albert Day. Lily's dad, Albert, had no education and toiled mostly as a laborer and fisherman. He also had a nasty temper that was intensified by his drinking, which he did when given the slightest opportunity. He would take on anyone willing to fight and if no one wanted to step up, he'd pick on whoever was handy. Albert's family, Anna and the children alike, were not spared from his angry, violent outbursts. He was a bad apple. Before Lily was a year old and Anna was six months pregnant with her fourth child, Albert was convicted and thrown into jail for 21 days for causing a violent disturbance in Lindsay. According to Wildcat, quote, the jailer noted that he was married, illiterate, intemperate, end quote. Then, while Albert was in jail, Anna gave birth to Lily's younger sister, Katie, who Lily then doted on and counted as her best friend for the rest of her life. Life was so tough for the family in those days that the Davy children did not have much time just to be kids. As soon as they could, as with many of the impoverished working class at the time, the Davy children were expected to work hard and do their part to keep the roof over their heads. As Anna was busy raising babies, she had five more by 1885, and Albert was drunk, a lot of the chore work around the shack they lived in fell to young Lily and her older siblings. Lily's dad Albert's behavior became more and more violent. He'd been tossed in jail for various short stints related to his violence. When Lily was only six, Albert Davy raped a young woman at knife point near train tracks outside of Lindsay. The young woman escaped after her dog chased Albert off. Later in court, the girl bravely identified Albert Davy from the stand. He was convicted and sentenced to a year behind bars and 12 lashes with a cat of nine tails. Jail didn't help Albert's disposition at all. When he got out, he was even angrier and more violent than when he'd gone into prison. So 12 lashes with a cat of nine tails, that's like, let me do the math. 108 lashes, essentially. Mm -hmm. When did they stop doing... Torture. Torture, you mean corporal punishment? Otherwise known as torture. Yeah, right. I guess so. <laughs> it looks like the abolition of corporal punishment in 1972. Wow, that's really recent. Yeah, so. That's really recent. Yep. That's like in my lifetime. It is in your lifetime. Barely, but in my lifetime. Yeah, so they stopped flogging prisoners in Canada in 1972. It's probably the right thing to do. You would think, yeah. I remember when you used to get the strap in school. For I, got, I got the strap. You got the times. strap. Yeah. Wow. I never did. I, I always neatly avoided that. Yeah. There's this little leather thing that the principal had. Mm, wow. And why did you get the strap? What possible infraction did you do that violence needed to be perpetrated against you? Uh, it was Tom's fault. But what did Tom do then? I don't know. I think we were like arguing or something. I, I didn't get into trouble very often. Mm hmm. But when I did, it was usually because I was being a joker. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's yeah. usually when I got into trouble too. Yeah. I rewatched The Terror, which is uh, about the Franklin Expedition. It's a great show. Yeah. And there was flogging in that. Mm -hmm. And they flogged one of the sailors as a boy. Right. And what the meaning of that is, is... On the bum. Yeah. Instead of flogging him on the back, they flogged him on the bum. That would hurt. It's horrendous. And it's supposed to be humiliating. Like, what a traumatic thing to do to somebody. I usually have to pay extra for that. <laughs> okay. Just kidding. And we'll move on from there. 
<laughs> oh, Matthew. I crack me up. To feed themselves and have some of the things they saw more wealthy children with, the Davy children turned to petty theft. According to the book Wildcat, Lily's oldest brother committed a rather brazen crime in 1880. Quote, Meanwhile, their oldest son, Willie, had been incorrigible from an early age. Because the family often did not have enough to eat, he became a sneak thief. One day in the spring of that year, 11-year-old Willie spotted a turkey hanging in the front door of a tannery. He quickly snatched it, then walked around to the back door of the tannery and sold it back to the unsuspecting owner. End quote. Willie soon involved Lily in his thieving ways. Two years after the turkey incident, Willie, now 13, and Lily, 11, got into trouble in a big way. The family, who'd moved numerous times, typically following Albert's work, landed in the town of Belleville, Ontario. Outside of the town, the youngsters stole a cow from a farmer's field and took it into town, where they sold it for $9 to a local merchant. The pair waited until no one was around, snuck into the merchant's barn and stole the cow again, selling it later to another buyer, this time for a $30 take. After trying to steal a watch only days later, Willie was caught and the cow theft affair soon came to light. Willie was convicted of theft and sent to Upper Canada's Boys Reformatory for a three-year stretch. As Lily was 11 and a girl, she was turned over to her parents, who were very unhappy with her. Lily grew into an attractive young woman. According to Wildcat in Tucson on May 26, 1954, William B. Willie Davy told the Arizona Historical Society about his sister's appearance and demeanor at the time. Quote, she was of French descent and called herself Lily de Laval, meaning Lily of the Valley, he said. When she reached her teens, she was very pretty and had a wonderful figure and voice, could imitate a croaking frog, an owl, and a hawk, could sing like a mockingbird, warble and trill like an oriole or a thrush. She was lithesome, blithe and witty, gushing with fun and jollity, also a wonderful dancer and very attractive. And everybody admired her and was very proud of her acquaintance, but she possessed one detrimental fault which brought her many troubles. She was too amorous and accepted too many dates with handsome young men, which finally caused her undoing." End quote. Also to earn cash, Lily and her older sister, Saffronia, turned to sex work. As this was the case for several of the Davy sisters, historians have posited that when they were children, they may have been sexually abused by a relative, perhaps even their father, given his history of sexual assault. Now, that's not to say every person, a sex worker, was abused by their parents at all. Not to say, but apparently... I read a study where that is predominant, not necessarily by a parent, but early sexualization by an adult. Hmm. Well, yeah, I could see mm -hmm. why that, because it's not so foreign. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And you wanted to mention something about Saffronia, that name? That's, that's, these names. They're fantastic. They're so cool. So, yeah, I think, it, you know... I always joke. I mean, I have friends who are Ashley, so I'm just joking about the name because there's so many print like spellings of Ashley. Sure. But I mean, imagine if we like changed all the Ashleys out there. So if you're born the first week of the month, mm -hmm. you know, your name is now Sophronia. Yes. The second week, you're Lily de Laval. Yes. Third week, we're going to call it Pearl Heart. Yeah. And fourth week, going back to an earlier episode, you're Tootsie La Flesh. Tootsie La Flesh. I still say that. Tootsie La Flesh. When Lily was 13, her pregnant mother was gang raped by four men. Two friends of the men later showed up and paid Anna $200 not to testify in the rape case against her attackers, threatening her to leave town. Anna took the money and left, afraid for her life. Albert told a friend that Anna had sent him a message letting him know she had left him and told him where to pick up the kids. People thought Albert had finally murdered Anna, but that wasn't the case. A famous detective became involved in the search for Anna. His name was Wilson Murray and was later the inspiration for the CBC period drama and TV show Murdoch Mysteries. Murray cracked the case, found Anna, and the trial of the four rapists went forward. Anna came back to Albert and the family moved to Rochester, New York for a new start. But the troubles continued and Albert continued regularly beating Anna and the kids. In 1886, Lily and Katie eventually ran away from home. 
To hide their identities and make themselves less vulnerable to predators, the sisters dressed in boys' clothing. They hopped a train that took them back to Canada and settled in Hamilton, Ontario. There, for the next few weeks, they worked and lived in a store owned by a grocer who did not allow them to leave and lock their clothing and other belongings in a trunk to keep them there. After picking the lock and grabbing their stuff, the sisters ran away. The grocer told police the girls had stolen from him. They were apprehended and sent back to Rochester to their parents. It was there that Lily met her future husband, Charles Dean, a violent ne'er-do-well, railroad brakeman and sometimes burglar. Lily married Charles Dean when she was just 16. The marriage didn't last long after. Just like her father had, Charles Dean began to beat up on Lily. Lily and her sister Katie ran away again dressed as boys. They hopped on a train headed west and got off in Wyndham, Minnesota, where they supported themselves through theft and hanging with unsavory characters. After a kindly hotelier took what he assumed to be two young men into his home, he and his wife discovered that the pair were actually girls. As a woman wearing a man's clothing was a big deal at the time, the story of these two runaways even made the papers. From Wildcat, quote, Typical Midwestern headlines read, Two young girls in pantaloons, masquerading in boys' attire, plucky girls, adventurous maidens, and two tough girls, end quote. Lily and Katie were held in a home for prostitutes and wayward girls on charges of disorderly conduct until enough money could be raised to send them back to Rochester again. It was reported that in court, while Lily cried, Sister Katie punched in the face one of the police officers who smiled at her during the proceedings. Only a month later, Lily and Katie escaped out a window of the third floor of the Erring Women's Refuge using their bed sheets and night clothes to fashion a rope which they then tied to a bed frame. They were caught only a day later and sent back to the home and days later were on a train bound for Rochester, New York, where the parents of the girls and Lily's husband, Charlie, awaited. The authorities were happy to see the back of the troublemakers. Lily's husband, Charlie Dean, soon got himself into hot water with a group of his friends and was thrown into prison being given two and a half years of hard labor for burglary. Lily didn't stick around in Rochester long. In spring of 1888, Lily, now 17, cut off her hair once again, dressed in men's clothing, and got on a train headed to Hamilton, Ontario. Lily was hanging out with the low lives there in the city and again, doing what she could to survive. She was picked up by police, and as she'd already had a record, was sentenced to almost two years in Toronto's Mercer Reformatory. It was reported that Lily grinned during the court proceedings, seeming to relish the attention. After her release from the Toronto Reformatory in 1890, she moved to Buffalo, New York, where 16-year-old Katie was now working as a madam running her own brothel. Buffalo was a nasty place at the time. From Wildcat, quote, an observer of that era explained that Buffalo was, quote, one of the roughest and most dangerous towns in America. It was sown with saloons. Along the waterfront were solid rows of dives, of the worst order barrel houses, cheap saloons, dens selling whiskey at four cents a glass, brothels, and gambling joints. Cutting a phrase were a daily affair. There were streets where the police walked at midday and only in pairs, for an officer who came along might shortly be found floating face down in the canal. The Irish longshoremen loved nothing more than a fight, and the prostitutes numbered in the hundreds." End quote. Lily Davy began calling herself Pearl Hart after a famed drug-addicted alcoholic buffalo brothel madam of the same name who later committed suicide. Katie became Minnie Hart, both continued working in sex work. And we'll take a break right here. And we are back. Any thoughts on this episode so far? We, we don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole on what I suspect you're going to want to talk about because yeah. we want to save some of that for the end. You see me bursting out the seams. I do. Yeah. Um, you know, Pearl and her sister, 
they're like entrepreneurial. Yeah. That's why I'm looking at them right now. I think so too. I think they were just doing what they needed to do. To get by. Yeah, exactly. Life was not exactly easy then. No, especially for women. Pearl Hart married again to a man named Dan Banman. She had stars in her eyes when it came to Dan. He was older and much more educated. He was able to speak French, German, and Spanish. He was also a talented pianist, which is what attracted Pearl in the first place, who'd always been a music lover. It's unclear whether Pearl had ever divorced Charlie Dean, but here she was claiming to be married again. Some believe that the relationship was never formalized, that the couple were only common-law married, not making Pearl a bigamist. To all accounts, Bandman was another bad apple, like the rest of the men in Pearl's life. He beat her and was well known to be an opium addict. The couple eventually ended up in Chicago, Illinois. On seeing the lady gunslinger, Annie Oakley, perform as a sharpshooter in Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show at the Chicago's World Fair, Pearl Hart was inspired. She began dreaming that her destiny was further west, but first... Pearl had to escape from Dan Banman's continued beatings, which were getting much more violent. Pearl told Cosmopolitan magazine later, quote, My husband began to abuse me, and presently he drove me from him. Then I returned to my mother in the village of Lindsay, Ontario, where I was born. Before long, my husband sent for me, and I went back to him. I loved him, and he promised to do better. I had not been with him two weeks before he began to abuse me again, and after bearing up under his blows as long as I could, I left him again. This was just as the World's Fair closed in Chicago in the fall of 1893. Instead of going home to my mother again, as I should have done, I took the train for Trinidad, Colorado. I was only 22 years old. I was good-looking, desperate, discouraged, and ready for anything that might come. End quote. Pearl was unwilling to get into much detail about the next few years of her life. She claimed that she started waiting tables in a hotel to make ends meet, but other reports indicate that it was a brothel rather than a hotel. Pearl, it was said, was serving customers in a different way. It is believed that she made her way west, working as a prostitute along the Santa Fe railway line, until finally settling in Phoenix, Arizona, a long way from Little Lindsay, Ontario, and from Dan Banman. According to Wildcat, quote, a Phoenix journalist later wrote, Pearl Hart is said by those who knew her to have always looked up to the romantic side of life, and while a resident of Phoenix was frequently known to have dressed up in men's clothes and paraded in public, end quote. It's not clear how, but in 1894, Dan Banman found Pearl Hart running into her on a Phoenix street. Pearl told Cosmopolitan magazine, I went from one city to another until, sometime later, I arrived in Phoenix, came face to face with my husband on the street one afternoon. I was not then the innocent schoolgirl he had enticed from home, father, mother, family, and friends. Far from it. I had been inured to the hardships of the world and knew much of its wickedness. Still, the old infatuation came back. I struggled against it. I knew if I went back to him, I should be more unhappy than I was, but I lost the battle. I did go back. We lived together for three years, and I was happy and good, for I dearly loved the man whose name I bore. During the first year of my married life, a boy was born to us, and a girl, while we were together at Phoenix. End quote. Bandman, though, had not changed at all. It didn't take long before he was regularly beating on Pearl once again. To dull the pain, Pearl fell into chain smoking, alcoholism, and also became addicted to morphine. Pearl also used opium daily with her abusive husband, Dan Banman, who put his musical skills to work, playing piano in local saloons and brothels to feed their habit. Dan Banman. Dan Banman. Like band man. So Dan Banman. What more musical name can you have, number one? I am Dan Banman. I'm Dan Bandman. (laughs) And I'm in a band. I'm in a band. I'm a one-man band. Called the Dan Banman Band. Exactly. (laughs) So I, we used to have a saying in the advertising business because we were, we were like as favored as lawyers. Uh, and the expression was, don't tell my mom uh, I work in advertising. She thinks I play piano in a brothel. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, I like it. 
Yeah, that that is kind of how it feels to be in advertising and marketing at some points. It's just like you feel like a real skeeve. Yeah, but, you know, if the devil has a story to tell in a budget, I'll tell it. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> it was a really big check. <laughs> Even though opiate use was not yet illegal in the U.S. at the time, the good people of Phoenix looked down their noses at Pearl Hart and her companions. From Wildcat, a journalist later spoke with people who knew of Pearl Hart's opium use in Phoenix. She was and is an inveterate smoker of cigarettes, in each of which she usually places some of the drug, he wrote, adding, Though soft-voiced and small, her violent temper led her into many scrapes, in all of which she displayed daring a man might envy. Whatever that means. Tired of being beaten up, Pearl claimed she had had enough. Left Dan Bamman again, sending her kids back to Lindsay, Ontario, to be with their grandmother, Pearl's mother. Pearl fled east in the hope she'd escape Dan forever. Banman, though, tracked Pearl down months later, and, ever the smooth talker, convinced Pearl Hart to give him another chance and moved to Tucson with her. Of course, nothing had changed. Once the money Pearl had earned during her time away from Banman was gone, he started beating her again. Finally, in an attempt to clean himself up, Dan joined the army. As soon as he was gone, seeing the writing on the wall, Pearl fled once again to Phoenix. She told Cosmopolitan Magazine she'd felt as though she were in hell those months with Dan Banman before he joined the regiment. Quote, I was tired of life. I wanted to die. And I tried to kill myself three or four times. I was restrained each time and I finally got employment, cooking for some miners at Mammoth. I lived there for a while, living in a tent pitched on the banks of the Gila River. The work was too hard and I packed my goods in a wagon and started to go to Globe, Arizona. I had to return to my old camp because the horses were unable to pull us through. A man named Joe Boot wanted to go to Globe too, and we made an arrangement with two Mormon boys to freight the whole outfit to Globe for $8. We camped out three miles from Globe and next day moved in, and I went to work again in a miner's boarding house. Then one of the big mines shut down and that left me with nothing to do." End quote. The region around Globe, Arizona had been a human settlement for a long time. Less than two miles south of the town was Beshbagawa, a settlement that had been occupied by the Salado indigenous populations between 1225 and 1400 CE. When Pearl was there, Globe was the epitome of a frontier town. The town got its name in 1875 when prospectors found an odd globe-shaped silver nugget in the San Carlos Apache Reservation. The silver was quickly depleted, but the veins of copper also found there made the Old Dominion mine one of the richest finds in the world and drew hard-working prospectors and rough characters from far and wide. All of them were hoping to strike it rich. Globe is also known for having links to the famed indigenous warrior Geronimo and the Apache Kid, whose trial was held in the Globe Courthouse in 1889. One of Pearl's brothers, who'd gotten himself into trouble, contacted her, begging for cash. Pearl sent him all her savings. Around the same time, Dan Banman reappeared. And as had happened before, things went sideways as soon as the couple got back together. They fought, and Dan Banman refused to work, expecting Pearl to take care of him. This time, she'd really had enough and tossed him out on his ear with the help of some male friends. It was the last time Dan Banman ever dared to darken Pearl Hart's door. She never saw him again. Thank God. Right? Finally. I've been waiting for that. Me too. The whole time I was researching this episode, I was hoping... Leave him! ...that she would <laughs> finally do that. It's tough, though. Yeah. I mean, I, I did some more research and tried to get a general idea of why is it that people don't just leave... An abusive relationship. It's complicated, I'm sure. It's totally complicated. Society normalizes unhealthy behavior, so people may under may not even understand that the relationship they're in is abusive. Especially back then. Right? It sounds like all the men were sort of drunken beaters at the time. Yeah. Yep, yeah, exactly. And emotional abuse. Even even her brother, she gave him all of her money. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Here's my money. Jesus. Yeah. Emotional abuse, 
destroys your self-esteem, making it feel impossible to start fresh. So you, you're you beat up. You think, well, I'm, you know, I need this guy. I, yeah. I've, he's told me over and over and over again, I won't be able to survive without him Yeah. or her or whoever is abusing you. Yeah. So she just thinks, well, I guess I need to have this in yeah, my yeah. life. The cycle of abuse. After every abusive incident comes a makeup honeymoon phase. Mm -hmm. In an Eddie Murphy sketch, he talks about Ike and Tina Turner. And it's like, Ike pounds the crap out of Tina. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I'm sorry, baby. Look what you made Ike do. Yeah. You know, like, look what you made Ike do. And that's, that's how those people think. That's how those people think. And then at the same time, here afterward... It's like, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm never going to do that again. I I don't know what came over me. Da, 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 da. And, yeah. And, no. and maybe the abuser even means it for a minute. Maybe you know? they do. Yeah. Control problems. Yeah. It's dangerous to leave. Like very dangerous. That's, Apparently. That's when it's the most dangerous for a woman to leave. The guy sees that um, he's lost the power. Right. That he wants to like reaffirm that power. Yep. Or just, or just. Like, hey, if I can't have you, nobody else can. Exactly. What makes men so little, some men so little like this? That's a great question. Because it's just little man. It's just like, there's mm -hmm. nothing manly about that. Yeah. In terms no. of, in terms of like the stereotype. Well, right? what is a man anyway? Like, yeah, that's true. Because like, I've not, you know, I've known people that are in gay relationships, lesbian relationships, blah, 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 where there's one person not treating the other one well. It can go across any sort of relationship, can it? People in abusive relationships also feel personally responsible for the behavior of the person abusing them. So it's probably some embarrassment as well. Like how the, how, how the heck did I get myself into this situation? Yeah, exactly. Right. Which they shouldn't feel embarrassed about. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, I spilled his coffee while I was delivering it to him. So he pounded me against the wall. I don't understand how people can do that to their partners. Yeah. And there's also that fear of how other people are going to react. You know, like you tell your mom and your dad yeah. that you're in an abusive relationship and maybe they say, well, you know, you sh maybe they even perpetuate the idea that, well, what did you do wrong to make them want to do that? Yeah, some people would be like that. Mm -hmm. Now completely out of cash, Pearl got a distressing letter from home. From the article, an Arizona episode in Cosmopolitan. Quote, On top of all my other troubles, I got a letter just at this time saying my mother was dying and asking me to come home if I wanted to see her alive again. That letter drove me crazy. No matter what I had been, my mother had been my dearest, truest friend, and I longed to see her again before she died. I had no money. I could get no money. From what I know now... I believe I became temporarily insane. Joe Boot, the man who freighted his goods over to Globe with me, told me he had a mining claim and offered to go out with me and try to dig up enough metal to get a passage home to Canada. We went out to the claim and both worked night and day. It was useless. The claim was no good. I handled pick and shovel like a man and began wearing men's clothes while I was mining there. I have never worked so hard in my life. And I've had some pretty hard experiences too, end quote. Pearl claimed that it was desperation that later drove her to the crime she'd become notorious for. Pearl Hart and Joe Boot's mining efforts were a complete waste of time. Pearl so wanted to get home to Anna, she was willing to do pretty much anything. Pearl claims it was Joe Boot who made the proposition that they rob the Globe stagecoach. She told Cosmopolitan, quote, It seemed a desperate undertaking for a woman of my size. Joe finally said it was easy enough and would, and no one would get hurt. A bold front, he said, is all that is necessary to rob any stage. Joe, I said, if you will promise me that no one will be hurt, I will go with you. He promised, and we made our plans, end quote. On May 29, 1899, Pearl and Joe made their move. They went off the beaten path so they would not be seen by folks traveling the main road. They hid near a bend in the road to wait for the Globe Phoenix stage behind cover. They heard the coach coming, and as it slowed down to negotiate the turn, they jumped out, guns in hand. Pearl described the events to Cosmopolitan. Quote, 
Joe drew a 45, said, throw up your hands. I drew my little 38 and likewise covered the occupants of the stage. Joe said to me, get off your horse. I did so. While he kept the people covered, he ordered them out of the stage. They were a badly scared outfit. I learned how easily a job of this kind could be done. Joe told me to search the passengers for arms. I carefully went through them all. They had no pistols. Joe motioned toward the stage. I advanced and searched it and found the brave passengers had left two of their guns behind them when ordered out of the stage. Really, I can't see why men carry revolvers because they almost invariably give them up at the very time that they were made to be used. They certainly don't want revolvers for playthings. I gave Joe a 44 and kept the 45 for myself. Joe told me to search the passengers for money. I did so and found on the fellow who was shaking the worst $390. This fellow was trembling so I could hardly get my hand in his pockets. The other fellow, a sort of dude, with his hair parted in the middle, tried to tell me how much he needed the money, but he yielded $36, a dime, and two nickels. And then I searched the remaining passenger, an Asian man. He was nearer my size and I just scared him to death. His clothes enabled me to go through him quickly. Only got $5, however. The stage driver had a few dollars, but after a council of war, we decided not to rob him. Then we gave each of the others a charitable contribution of a dollar apiece and ordered them to move on, Joe warning them all not to look back as they valued their lives, end quote. Pearl and Joe watched as the stagecoach left before running back to where they'd secreted their horses and took off at a gallop, aiming for Benson, Arizona, where Pearl would catch a train and make her way back to Canada to see her mother. They stayed off the main roads and traveled mostly in the darkness. They made it only a few days before the law in the form of Sheriff William Truman and his posse caught up with them. From an Arizona episode in Cosmo, quote, This day which proved to be our last day of freedom, at least for a while, we spent sleeping and cooking. The rain fell in torrents and we were very uncomfortable. At night we again started and rode until five o'clock in the morning. Just after daylight, we came across a mountain lion and gave chase for two miles, but could not get a shot. After this, we lay down, but were destined not to sleep for long. About three hours after lying down, we were awakened by yelling and shooting. We sprang up and grabbed our guns, but found we were looking straight into the mouths of two gaping Winchesters in the hands of the sheriff's posse. Resistance was worse than useless, and we put up our hands. At the time of our capture, we were within 20 miles of Benson, the railroad station we were making for. Had we reached Benson, I believe we should have escaped. End quote. The pair spent time in jail cells next to each other where newspapers reported that Joe affectionately reached out his hands between the bars to Pearl, who was still clad in men's clothing. They were eventually split up. Joe stayed in Florence, where they'd been held together for a time, and Pearl would be taken to Tucson's Pima County Jail, where there were better jail facilities in which a woman could be held. Pearl later admitted that she had tried to kill herself after being separated from Joe Boot, but also said that she was glad she did not succeed. While awaiting trial in jail in Tucson, Pearl caught the attention of another prisoner, Ed Hogan, who was in the Hooskow serving time for drunken disorderly conduct. From the Encyclopedia of Lawmen, Outlaws, and Gunmen by Leon Claire Metz, quote, During the night of October 12, 1899, Someone forgot to lock a door leading to the outside. Hogan escaped. Once free, however, he broke back in again, knocked a hole in the wall and took Pearl, who had not yet even gone to trial, with him. She and Logan got as far as Deming, New Mexico, where U.S. Deputy Marshal George Scarborough arrested both and returned them to the Arizona jail. At trial, Joe Boot pleaded guilty of holding up the Phoenix stage and got a sentence of 30 years hard labor. It was a different story for Pearl Hart, though. Joe Boot testified on Pearl's behalf, claiming that he had coerced Pearl into committing the robbery. She was found not guilty for the robbery of the stage. The next day, however, as the prosecutor was still out to get her, in a second trial, Pearl was found guilty of robbing the stagecoach driver of his pistol. She was subsequently sentenced to five years in a territorial prison. Witnesses who came forward later said it was Pearl who was the mastermind and had planned the whole affair after luring Boot into her employ using sexual favors as payment, leading Boot to believe he was Pearl's latest love. The book, Wildcat, quoted an Arizona newspaper with a witness account, quote, 
Several townsfolk spotted the two strangers in Riverside, and one of them insisted that the hold-up plan originated with Pearl, not Joe. The witness overheard them discussing a possible robbery, and Boot declared, I could never do it. Never, never, never. But you must. We must, she insisted. And it's easy. All you'll have to do is to hold your gun out straight and keep quiet. I'll do the rest. End quote. Newspapers named Pearl Hart a prostitute, drug addict, and claimed she was the brains of the operation and Joe Boot was her willing lackey. From the newspaper of the Florence Tribune, quote, The woman is well known in Phoenix, where she was a resident of Block 41. She is a confirmed morphine fiend, requires 10 grams eight times a day to keep herself in shape. The man, Boot, seems to be a harmless sort of an individual and evidently much the weaker of the two though he was a man enough on examination to take most of the blame upon himself. Another newspaper was nastier to Joe Boot, saying, quote, Boot is a weak, morphine-depraved specimen of male mortality without spirit and lacking intelligence and activity. It is plain that the woman was the leader of this partnership, End quote. According to the Encyclopedia of Lawmen, Outlaws, and Gunmen, Pearl later wrote of her real feelings about Joe Boot. Why, the fellow hadn't an ounce of sand. While I was going through the passengers, his hands were shaking like leaves. Why, if I hadn't more nerve than that, I'd jump off the earth. End quote. On December 2, 1902, Pearl was paroled after the Arizona governor stepped in. The Arizona Sentinel wrote that Pearl was, quote, in good health, free from the opium habit. End quote. She moved to Kansas City, where she attempted to cash in on her time as a lady bandit. She even performed in a production written by her sister about Pearl's exploits. She was later arrested in Kansas City for buying stolen goods. She also wrote a bit of poetry. By 1903, she was running a cigar and tobacco stand in Kansas. She died on December 30, 1955, at 84 years of age, having been married to a man named George Calvin Cal Bywater for 50 years. Pearl was a human being with many facets. I found myself struggling with how to approach the telling of this problematic character story. There were so many aspects to Pearl Hart's life, and what motivated her to commit the crime she did seems sort of nebulous. It's hard to put Pearl into a box. Was she a criminal, a survivor, or both? By definition, yes, she did criminal things. But was Pearl Hart a bad person? Or was Pearl, as Charles Manson claimed about himself years later, just a product of her abusive and impoverished environment? Where does the responsibility for one's actions truly lie? Regardless of all that, what a fantastically human story. Thanks again to Mark Torrey for the heads up on the tale of Pearl Hart. What do you think of Pearl Hart, Matthew. So this is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Just bear with me here for a second. Sure. Okay. We have to look back at like context, right? So let's look at the context of the time that she was in, right? Because context sort of creates a meaning. It is a rough time, both for men and women, but probably especially for women. But if you're like a man with no money, it was a rough time as well, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So the way I look at it is in my head, you know, sex work shouldn't be illegal. It's That just makes it more, I've spoken about this before, just makes it more dangerous for sex workers. Yeah. Drugs, in my mind, shouldn't be illegal. To me, it's a public health concern, not a criminal issue. Mm -hmm. Right? So, as a sex worker, she was just trying to survive. Yep, make ends meet. As an addict, she was just trying to numb the pain of, I think she went through a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Totally, she went through a lot. I'm listening to you, and I'm like... So the men in her life did way worse than she ever did. Totally. Like, w- like way worse than she ever did, but they got marginal punishment, if anything at all. Yeah, like Dan right? Bandman beat the crap out of her. So domestic violence, being held captive with her sister and forced into work like a slave. She escapes, but the shopkeeper like points fingers as they stole, so they get into trouble. Mm-hmm. You know, he was like locking them in. Yep. Right? You know, I look at it and I'm like, okay, so she has a few shoplifting points and a stagecoach robbery. Sure. Okay. You know, that's not a nice thing to do. Hold a gun to people and right. steal from them. Yep. But she's painted as this criminal mastermind at the end. Yeah. But I think it's because it's like, she's a woman. So how dare she do something a man does, even if it's like a bad thing that a man typically does. Right. right? Exactly. So it's sort of like this, how dare she? How dare she wear men's clothes? How dare she be that audacious? <laughs> yeah. Um, and 
So if, if imagine if this was a guy, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so listen to this. Okay, Mike, let's do a podcast about a guy who robbed a stagecoach once, once, yep. and got $400. 100% the reason it's why. Like, 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 if it's a guy, like we, he has to be a serial killer or robbed a thousand stagecoaches mm -hmm. or done a mass murder because, but it's a woman who's robbed one stagecoach once for 400 bucks and there's like books and Cosmopolitan and dark poutine podcasts about her. Yep. Well, th <laughs> this is entirely why I wanted to cover Pearl Hart yeah. because that's what I discovered about her as I read, why are people so interested in Pearl? Because she was doing things, as you said, that men would do and would probably get away with. It's really, well, not necessarily get away with. So that men would do, but they weren't as serious as some of the things that were done to her. Yeah. And also, there's that whole idea, like, they played the sympathy card for the stagecoach robbery. Mm -hmm. uh, this other guy came in, uh, Joe Boot came in and said, well, you know. That's Boot. Uh, das Boot came in and said, I am the guy who actually planned it all. And we don't know whether or not it was actually Pearl or him. It's, lost it's history, all like, hearsay. It's yeah. all nonsense. But, and societally back then and often now, she was looked at as the fairer sex, you know? Oh, well, he must be telling the truth because she's a woman. Mm. So she gets off of the stagecoach robbery charge. Mm. She doesn't get off of the stealing the handgun from the person during the stagecoach robbery yeah. because I think like the prosecutor was like, oh no, we need to come up with something else to go after her for because, mm. and they try to play the sympathy card again, but it's too black and white at this point. I mean, you know, in the end, good for her. She milked it, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to post some pictures of her. Obviously she sat for the camera probably after all of this. Oh yeah. Because maybe she made a few bucks and well, she did. They, her sister wrote a play got about a bit her. Of, well, uh, no playwright I know of has ever made any money, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, back, the, back then they did make some That's cash. That's true. Yeah. Um, but didn't you find it kind of sweet that they gave all the people in stagecoach a dollar so they wouldn't be completely out? Right. Here's, here's <laughs> was like, a, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> yeah, but we don't know if that's true. That's just what she told Cosmopolitan. My, well, I'm going to believe her. I like that. Sure. I like that part of the story. Yeah, Pearl it's was now an, the truth. Pearl was an interesting character. She's uh, yeah, yeah. I really kind of dug this story from the whole aspect of it, and I'll, I'll go on to. Uh, I, I was thinking that it would make a great movie and, uh, I found that there was, there was one that had been done recently. Right. And the, it was called the not so inspired title, the woman who robbed the stagecoach. Oh God. And, uh, it's IMDB page also brags that the movie is first Western feature made on an iPhone. So I'm not sure. Oh, that's bad. Right. I'm not sure if it's any good or if anybody has seen it, please can, let me know. I can tell you now it's not. Yeah. But I think Pearl's story deserves a big budget treatment, not just a small budget thing. Like, let's tell Pearl's story in a big way. Well, I kind of like, well, in a way though, she robbed us. Like, that's actually a very good name for the movie. The, yeah, well, the woman who robbed the stagecoach because that's what she did and we'll shoot on an iphone to show how unimportant the actual robbery was <laughs> yeah i don't think they thought about it that way Matthew. it's, it's cool but it's an interesting i think it's a really interesting story because it's a story about um a woman surviving and a woman doing something a man would have done yeah. Right. But and so, and, then, and, so, and so getting in trouble for it. So it becomes as much bigger thing. It's yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that is it for Dark Poutine episode one hundred and ninety eight. Wild West Canadians, the Lady Bandit, Pearl Hart. Now it's time for voicemails. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or one 877 dark -PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All right, here's our first call this week. Hi, Mike and Matthew. It's Vanessa. I'm a Yumber Yard member since day one. Love the show. Love that you are doing such a great job supporting the victim and not 
naming the predator. I find that you guys are the ones that respect the most the victim. And I love that there's always a support group online when you have a question about either book or recommendations when you're traveling. Thanks to Yumber Yard when I traveled to New Brunswick, they were able to help me out finding some nice true crime areas that I can go visit and pay my respects to the victim. Cool. Thanks, and go shit in your tube. Bye. Well, there you go. Um, That's great. I'm glad that we can provide that. Sometimes we do have to mention perpetrators. It's not always that we don't. Um, it's uh, something that I get a feel for as I'm writing an episode. Yeah, really. and it's about not heroing them. Exactly. Yeah, I think a lot of shows actually hero these guys. Right. Or girls, yeah. whatever, right? Yeah, sensationalize, um, uh, sort yeah. of idolize in a way. Di- yeah, it's slightly different. Yeah. So I try not to do that. Thanks for calling. Thank you for calling. Uh, let's listen to the second voicemail. This one looks like it's long. We'll see. Hey, Mike and Matthew. This is Heather from Guelph. Uh, Lana and I are enjoying a quiet morning at home, getting caught up on the podcast as we do every week. And I was uh, struck by one of your questions, Mike, in this week's episode. So I thought I'd call. I've never called before because I'm really anxious socially. So <laughs> I decided to give my fears a run for their money and give you a jingle. Um, Mike, you asked in this week's episode um, about Hannah, um, why people with, from Europe chose to immigrate to Canada. And I wanted to tell you my grandfather's reasoning. Um, in May of 1954, he and my grandmother and my mother, who was two years old at the time, um, immigrated to Canada from Birmingham, England, which is where they lived. Um, even almost 10 years after the end of World War II, it was still a, a tough place to live. And they knew that they needed to move in order to survive. And the reason that my grandfather chose Canada was because he had been there before. Um, He was an orphan and he was sent to Canada uh, for most of his youth as one of the British home children, which is a whole other part of Canada's dark history. Um, May make an interesting episode, not sure. Otherwise, definitely fun to research, not fun, but dark to research, I suppose. Anyways, um, he was one of the lucky ones in that he survived and was treated nicely. And because he was familiar with Canada when he was immigrating in the 50s, that's just where he decided to go back to the Montreal area and ended up actually reconnecting with the family he worked for when he was a child. And they became best friends uh, until the end of their days. So a really interesting and happy ending story. Uh, That's also a reason why... If you go to the eastern townships in Quebec, there's such a large British settlement. And you'll also find that in most of the grocery stores there, um, they will have a British section, um, basically because there are so many settled British population there. Um, I spent all my summers in the eastern townships, so it makes me kind of sentimental talking about it. Anyways, I hope you guys have a great week. Can't wait to listen to next week's episode. Mike, your book is fantastic. I'm really, really enjoying it. And Matthew, uh, please give Steve some snout kisses from Lana because she misses him. <laughs> Thanks, guys, and take a shit in your hat. Bye-bye. Wow, that's great. What a, what an interesting voicemail, I thought. Okay, first, first of all, yep. you know, if you're socially, what, what we said at the beginning, <laughs> that was like a great, calm yeah. Voicemail. Yeah, you, you should, didn't sound like you were panicked you at all. You should call it more often. Yeah. <laughs> Secondly, thank you, Lana's mom. Exactly. I love Lana. Um, but Mike, have you heard about the um, British home children? No, I got to say, I am uh, completely ignorant of that. I wrote it down as she was talking about yeah. it as a possible episode and something I want to look into. Yeah, yeah look, read, it, read about it. It's really interesting. Mm-hmm. It, it is kind of a part of the dark history of Canada yep, as well. Yep. Um, it's interesting that your dad was, was one, and, and I'm so glad that he actually um, was friends with the family. It sounds like his experience maybe wasn't as bad as some of the others. Right, yeah. And, um, yeah, Birmingham's still a crap hole, so... Um, <laughs> Birmingham? <laughs> I'm Ozzy Osbourne, I'm Sorry, from Birmingham. Sorry, if you're from Birmingham, I'm joking. I've never been there. Just everyone in London is so snobby, they always like make, make fun of Birmingham. But so, that is where so Ozzy's you, from. I mean. You can you can call next week and give me crap for making fun of Birmingham. I'm from Birmingham. <laughs> anyway, that was 
Northerners. Uh, that's Northern, right? Oh, yeah. Birmingham. It's yeah. Graham up north. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's like Liverpool. Liverpudlians. Liverpudlians. The Beatles. <laughs> anyway. Whenever anyone hears Liverpool, they're like, the Beatles. Yeah, exactly. Well, also a port. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on to our third voicemail. This one's not quite as long, but we'll have a listen. Hey, Mike. It's Cole from Edmonton, Alberta. Um, I'm actually just working and I was listening to the Slippery as an Eel episode. And you were mentioning about walking past people who are descendants of uh, fugitives and all that. And I thought it was really funny because I actually have a story about that. Um, I'm actually a descendant of Cole Younger, as you mentioned in that episode of the Younger and James Gang. And which is crazy because not a lot of Canadians know about it, know about the younger side of it. They know Jesse James, but they don't know Cole Younger. And um, funny enough, I was actually in a restaurant in Missouri around the same town that they did the first bank robbery in. And the waitress was fascinated by the fact I was like just staring at this poster of him that was wanted from back then. And um, she was like, oh, uh, well, why are you staring at it so long? Is something cool about it? I was like, oh, no, that's just my great, great, great uncle. And she just, eyes just shot to the back of her head. She's like, what? But anyways, I just want to thank you guys so much for the show. I've been binge watching it and, uh, or binge listening, sorry. <laughs> and I just want to say that you guys have made my work day a lot easier, especially during times when I've wanted to just listen and sit down and relax and music gets boring. And um, in the most Canadian way that I can say this, go shit in your hat. Well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, he was talking about episode 170, uh, The Tale of Ernest Cashel. That's really cool that uh, he is a descendant of uh, one of those gangs that yeah. we talked about in that episode. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm I'm always curious about, you know, what does a family talk about when they talk about, well, great grandpa was X, Y, Z. How do they deal with, how do you deal with that? Um, you know, like... So and so was hung because, you know, yeah, really, really crazy. We don't, we don't have any of those stories in our family. I don't have any that I'm aware of. I mean, we have like somebody who was a famous opera singer mm -hmm. a very long time ago, but no sort of uh, darker. Well, my cousin Rude traced our roots all the way back to the Rima, who was the father, the rabbi who was the father of modern Judaism. There you go. So, and he was a direct descendant of uh, King David. So that means that I am a direct descendant of King David, if that's all factual. Father Abraham had yeah, seven sons. Exactly. <laughs> seven sons had father. Can you, oh, yeah. can you tell me about the Christian summer camp? Thank you for calling Cole. Yes. Super interesting stuff. I guess it's time for us to move on to Patreon and Donut Money Donors Patreon. for the week. And first up, we have a patron from... Hong Kong. Yay. Ashley Yu. Is Ashley, is this our first Hong Kong Patreon? I think we've had at least one more. Okay. But uh, Ashley Yu from Hong Kong. I love it when there's somebody who is from a place other than... Uh, oh, and I was making fun of Ashley's today. Yeah. So your name is now... Tootsie La Flesh. To, or no, I think she's more Lily, Lily de la Val. Lily de la, oh yeah, the Lily of the Valley. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. I like that. Well, thank you from Hong Kong. So what does Ashley Yu do there in Hong Kong? I think she's like the empress of the island Shangri-La Hong Kong hotel. Oh. Such a nice hotel. Oh. Such a beautiful hotel. <laughs> Are you telling me to move my hand away from my face? Because <laughs> yes. it's it distracting the listeners? No, because I can't. It it actually Sorry. does make a difference. Sorry. <laughs> it muffles your voice. Mumble, mumble, mumble. Yeah, exactly. So thank you, Ashley. Thank and, you, Ashley. And enjoy. I wonder if Ashley ever comes to Vancouver. I don't know. Lots of people from that area do. Uh, I know I used to work with a lot of people from Hong Kong, actually. You know, I heard that at one point, Vancouver, 15% of Vancouver was born in Hong Kong. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Yeah. That's actually kind of cool. Just across the water. Just across the water. And next we have Heather. And Heather is from Smith's Falls, Ontario. Smith's Falls. 
and not Niagara Falls, but Smith's Falls. It's, yeah, it's owned by the Smith. It is. Is it yeah. the Smiths? Like uh, Morrissey owns it. Smith. Well, he did. Panic on the streets of London. Until he became a dick. Yeah, he's such a moany person. He's a moany moany. No, moany moany. Moany moany. And what does Heather do there in Smith's Falls on Terrible? Don't call it on Terrible. I'm kid. I knew it would get a rise out of you. <laughs> what does she do there, Matthew? She actually has um, behind the falls. Mm -hmm. There's like a secret passage. Oh dear. And uh, she's kind of like. Um, like Batman. Yeah. So she's Bat Lady. She's. She's Bat Person. I was going to say Bruce Wayne. So what's a female version of Bruce? Heather. She's Heather, Heather Wayne. She's Heather Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. She like saves, saves Smith Falls from the penguin in the Joker. Uh, okay. There you go. Thank Smith, you. Smith's Falls is Canada's Gotham. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Have you been? It's like, it's like, it's that big. <laughs> no, yeah. I didn't know it Sky, existed. Skyscrapers. Oh, wow. Yeah. Next we have Lisa Windsor and she's one of our donut money donors. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. She says... I have been listening for a few years. Never miss an episode. I've been meaning to donate for a while. So for th thanks for the reminder to help out and send some donut money. Hope it helps a little. It helps a lot. Thank you, Linza. And she's from Baltimore, Ontario. I didn't know there was such a thing as Baltimore, Ontario. I didn't know that either. It's interesting. I wonder if she um, changed her name from Saxe, Coburg und Gotha to Windsor. What, <laughs> why would she do that? Because... That's what's what the royal family did. Oh, okay. So they were Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha, and they changed their name to Windsor after the war. You mean Goethe? Gotha, G O T H A. Oh, okay. I don't know. I'm probably saying it the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Um, and what does she do there in Baltimore, Ontario? Does she play on the baseball team, the Baltimore <laughs> Orioles? It's just too easy. Do you know how often she probably hears that? Uh, Not do you play, but do they have Baltimore? Yeah. I, I think she, what is, where's Baltimore? Hold on. I need to look this up. Okay. Because I'm from Ontario and I've never heard of Baltimore. It's a village mm -hmm. in Ontario. Oh, yep. oh, it's down there. It's near Rice Lake. Okay. Yeah. It's, and it's near Coburg. So I think she does, she like on the beach mm -hmm. nearby in yep. the summertime, she rents, um, Sea dews. Oh, that's very or, cool. What are they called? What are they called? Yeah, sea dew is fine. Sea dews. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what she does. Awesome. Jet skis. Yeah. Jet skis. Yeah, we don't want to use a brand. Um. So thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa from Baltimore. Oh my goodness! Looks like we got some donut money from Lori Saint Germain. <laughs> Lori Saint Germain. She says, "Hey, Mike and Matthew, we, we please." Know Lori. Please grab a double double and donuts and a chewy for Steve from Aww. Spock. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. That's so cute. That's lovely. Thank you, Lori, so much. And um, I guess we're going to take a wild guess on where Lori Saint Germain is from. We can probably look on her Facebook to yeah, really I, figure it out. But let's let's just make something up. Where is she from? She's from Carefree, Arizona. Oh, isn't that nice? Carefree, Arizona. So it was a planned city. Oh, okay. And so all the streets are like named Ho Hum Boulevard and Easy Street and Nevermind Trail. Oh, that's nice. I kind of like that. I'd stuff. love to live on the corner of Ho Road and Hum Road. Ho and Hum. <laughs> that is really funny. <laughs> um, what does Lori do there? <laughs> Nothing. Good for her. She kick backs and she kicks back and relaxes. There you go. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. Why don't you do it for the rest of the day after we're done all this? <sighs> <laughs> Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors, past and present for your generosity. It helps keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot to us if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. You can find Supernatural Circumstances there too, my other podcast. If you haven't gotten yours yet, please buy my book. People say it's good. Hey, I got uh, three stories in last night. Oh, did you? Yeah. How's that? 
couldn't even spell murder. Oh my god! Right? <laughs> yeah, like, we I'm won't like, go into why. It morons. Went, anyway, yeah. read the book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, they were pretty dumb. Yeah. If you want to, you can check out our website, darkpatine.com. I'll post some pictures of uh, our most recent episode of our Lady Bandit, Pearl Hart, uh, in the show notes. And that's at darkpatine.com. Please give Dark Patine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. And most importantly, thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. A breathy bye. A breathy bye from your babe. <laughs> from a couple of bumholes. <laughs>